I've had requests to make a video about disability and autoimmune diseases. So that's the topic of this video today. <clears throat> it's a somewhat difficult topic because it can get quite technical and confusing, but I'll try and make it simple. The other issue that I see a lot with disability and autoimmune diseases is more than half, not all, but more than half the patients who tell me they have an autoimmune condition don't actually have it. And I'm going to explain how to know if you have an autoimmune di disease or not, and why so many people are confused about what they have. Hello, I'm John Foster. I'm a medical doctor who does social security disability exams. I've done quite a few, and as usual, everything I say reflects my own opinions based on my own experience and study, and not the opinions of the Social Security Administration or any other medical body. Now, for you to understand autoimmune disease, I need to go over a few basics of the immune system. Everyone has an immune system and it consists of cells that make chemicals and cells that actually do things to sort of act as the body's armed guards. The immune system is constantly checking for things that don't belong in your body. Those things consist of germs such as viruses, bacteria, fungus, protozoa, which are microscopic animals, and helminths, which are worms. The immune system also is checking for foreign bodies. Things like splinters, also transplanted organs, and finally the immune system is checking for certain cancers. When the immune system detects anything that it thinks shouldn't be in your body, it becomes activated and tries to get that out of your body, often, as in the case with bacteria, by killing it. If you don't have an immune system, you will die, almost always, by infection. There is a terrible condition called severe combined immune deficiency syndrome where a baby is born without an immune system and these children used to all die before they reached one year of age of infections. Now they can receive a stem cell transplant which are cells from another person that form an immune system in the body of the transplanted infant and protect it from infection and they can live quite a long time. Now, the hallmark of an activated immune system is inflammation. And inflammation has four components. In Latin, they are calor, rubor, tumor, and dolor. In English, calor is heat or warmth. Inflamed tissue becomes warm to the touch. Rubor is redness. Inflamed tissue is red. Tumor is swelling. Inflamed tissue is swollen. And dolor is pain. Inflamed tissue is painful. I'm sure all of you at some point in your life have had a bad sore throat. And if you looked at your throat in the mirror, you would see that it was red and swollen and you know that it felt painful. You probably didn't feel the temperature, but if you did, you would have felt that it was warm. If there is no inflammation, the immune system is not activated and that's going to become important. And if you're finding this video interesting, you might want to like it and subscribe to my channel. I generally put out one disability video a week. Now, an autoimmune disease is where the immune system becomes confused. It thinks that normal tissue in the body shouldn't be there, and so it attacks it and tries to kill it and this produces inflammation in the body. 
In autoimmune diseases, the immune system can attack any part of the body, from the hair on the top of the head down to the toes, and any combination of parts of the body. And what that means is there can be all sorts of problems and issues and symptoms in patients with an autoimmune condition. We group autoimmune conditions into different diagnoses based on the patterns of tissues involved. But these diagnoses are kind of vague and there's a lot of overlap. Because of that, simply stating the name of your disease doesn't tell anyone what problems you have. Here's an example. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune condition where the immune system attacks joints in the body and these joints become red and swollen and painful. However, some people with rheumatoid arthritis have problems with other organs. For example, I saw a patient for a social security disability exam who had clear-cut rheumatoid arthritis in their joints, but also had inflammation of the lungs, and they easily became short of breath. And that's important because shortness of breath with minimal exertion is considered very important by Social Security. You can't do any physical work if you become short of breath just walking across the room. Because they can attack so many different tissues in unusual ways, some problems caused by autoimmune diseases can be really weird or rare. For example, an autoimmune disease of children called Kawasaki disease often causes inflammation of the blood vessels in the heart and can cause a five or six year old to have a heart attack. Lupus, which is a disease that affects many different organs, sometimes causes inflammation of the brain called lupus cerebritis and it can actually seem like the patient is psychotic, like they're insane or have a psychiatric disease when the actual problem is that their brain isn't working well because it's inflamed. Another example is inflammatory bowel disease, commonly Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. It's not uncommon for people with these diseases of their intestines to also have inflammation of their skin, eyes, or joints, or some combination of those. Finally, autoimmune diseases are, are notorious for having a waxing and waning course. Sometimes they'll be quite severe, and sometimes they'll almost seem to go away, unpredictably, regardless of treatment. I had a woman I did a social security disability exam on who told me that she had lupus. And I was kind of surprised because although she seemed like a straight shooter, I could find no signs of lupus on her exam. Lupus commonly causes a rash on the face and inflammation of the joints. So I pointed out to her that I didn't see signs of lupus and she told me that she was having a good spell and got out her phone and showed me pictures of when she'd had a bad spell. And in the pictures she had quite a severe rash on her face, absolutely typical of lupus and her hands were very swollen at the joints and red. If I hadn't seen the pictures on the phone, I would have doubted whether she had lupus or not. So, as I said, in order to prove the existence of an autoimmune disease, there must be evidence of inflammation. This can be on the physical exam, looking for warm, red, hot, or tender areas of the body. It can be found in blood and urine tests, and sometimes in tests like x-rays or MRIs. 
but most important is biopsy. Biopsy is when a small amount of tissue, about the size of a pencil eraser, is taken from an inf affected organ and looked at under the microscope. In an autoimmune disease, there will always be evidence of inflammation with a biopsy. If there is no evidence of inflammation, the patient does not have an autoimmune disease. So why do so many people believe they have an autoimmune disease when they do not? Well, to understand that, you need to understand a little bit about the psychology of doctors and patients. There are a lot of patients where doctors can do a thorough exam, thorough history, all sorts of tests, and not have a clue what's causing the patient's problems. And an honest doctor will tell the patient, I don't know what's causing your problems. But for a lot of patients, that's a very unsatisfactory answer. They want a diagnosis and they will keep going to a doctor until they get a diagnosis. Many of these patients have pain as a symptom, but no other manifestations of disease, no evidence of inflammation. When the physician does a slew of tests, some tests for autoimmune disease may come back positive. Here's the problem. Blood tests for autoimmune disease are not very reliable there is a high percentage of false negatives. For example, a significant number of people with rheumatoid arthritis will have a negative blood test for rheumatoid arthritis, called the rheumatoid factor. And then a significant number of people without rheumatoid arthritis will have a positive blood test for the rheumatoid factor. Without evidence of arthritis, a positive rheumatoid factor is meaningless. But these folks with pain and pain alone may have a positive rheumatoid factor and then they're told, oh, you have a rheumatoid arthritis. And then the patient is happy and thinks the doctor is wonderful. Similarly, many other tests for autoimmune disease, such as the anti-nuclear antibody for lupus, have large numbers of false negatives and false positives. The bottom line is, if you only have one of the four manifestations of warmth, redness, swelling, and heat, you probably don't have an autoimmune disease. If you have two, you may. If you have three, there's a very good chance. And if you have four and your body isn't fighting something like an infection and it's attacking normal tissue, then you have an autoimmune disease regardless of what your blood tests show. The bottom line is if there is no evidence of inflammation, there is no autoimmune disease. Now, here's the crucial point if you're applying for disability. You must spell out all the different ways that an autoimmune disease affects you. Because by simply mentioning the diagnosis, the doctor examining you and Social Security may have no idea of what all is wrong with you. As an example, that patient I mentioned with rheumatoid arthritis needed to spell out the fact that it was affecting their lungs and causing shortness of breath because that's not common with people with rheumatoid arthritis. Well, I hope this has been helpful and as always remember, if it happens, it's possible.